Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our daily Hindu analysis. Before we begin, don't forget to join our Telegram channel for receiving regular updates on current affairs. The link for joining the Telegram channel has been provided in the description box below and you can even scan the QR code provided over here. So let's get started with the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from page number 12 of the Delhi edition. This article examines a few controversial provisions of the Special Marriage Act of 1954. So before we look at the article, first let's understand what is the Special Marriage Act and what is its relevance in the context of Indian society. See in India, all marriages that take place within a particular faith or religion, they are registered and solemnized as per the provisions of the respective personal laws such as the Hindu Marriage Act the muslim marriage act etc but to provide for interfaith and intercaste marriages we have a special law in place which is the special marriage act of 1954 this law which was enacted by the parliament provides for civil marriages in the country involving the people of india and as well as all indian nationals who are abroad it provides for registration and solemnization of all marriages irrespective of religion faith or caste followed by either of the parties it essentially provides for two consenting adults to marry each other without having to change their respective religions and is seen to be in line with india's constitutional provisions and fundamental rights this act lays down the procedure for solemnization and registration of marriages amongst all couples irrespective of the religion or caste they belong to and it essentially allows two consenting adults to marry a person of their choice which has even been recognized as a fundamental right under article 21 by the supreme court but few provisions of the law have been controversial especially section 6 to section 10 as it requires the interfaith intercaste couple to announce their marriage at least one month before and they have to submit all the relevant documents to the marriage officer at the registration office and these personal details of the couple have to be made public as per the law which creates a scope for either the family or vigilante groups or even the state to interfere with those marriages and is thus seen to be violative of constitutionally guaranteed fundamental rights as per the critics of the law so this explained article on page number 12 deals with this controversy because recently a few petitioners who have been affected by these provisions of the law they had approached the supreme court with a writ petition challenging these controversial provisions of the special marriage act the challenge raised by the petitioners was specifically against section 5 of the special marriage act according to which when a interfaith or intercaste couple intend to marry each other they need to provide a notice of 30 days before the marriage and this has been seen by the petitioners as a violation of their right to privacy which is guaranteed as a fundamental right under article 21 that was upheld by the supreme court recently in the landmark ks puttaswami case the petitioners had also argued that the mandatory provision requiring to make their marriage public even before the event takes place was seen to be violative of right to equality guaranteed under article 14 and 15 and they argued that these provisions would lead to discrimination on the grounds of religion and caste which is a violation of these fundamental rights but however the supreme court has dismissed the petition thereby upholding the constitutionality of these provisions of the special marriage act so in this context it becomes important to take a look at section 6 to section 10 which are a follow up to section 5 that details the procedure to be followed for interfaith intercaste marriages especially with regard to the public notice that has to be provided one month before the marriage as per section 6 which follows up on section 5 the marriage officers in the registration office they have to note down the details provided by the couple in the marriage notice book along with attaching all the relevant documents and according to section 7 this has to be made public on the notice board at the marriage office so that any third party can raise an objection against the marriage section 7 provides the process for making an objection such as if either of the party already has a living spouse 
or is incapable of giving consent due to unsoundness of mind or is suffering from a mental disorder resulting in the person being unfit for marriage or procreation on these grounds even third parties can raise an objection against the marriage and if such an objection were to be raised under section 8 the concerned authorities are required to conduct an inquiry and it describes the inquiry procedure and as a result of these four provisions that is from section 5 to section 8 the personal details of the couple who intend to marry becomes public which quite often is misused by several anti social elements and vigilante groups who are opposed to interfaith and intercaste marriages the petitioners argued that this often leads to the harassment of couples not just at the hands of these vigilante groups and anti social outfits but also exposes them to harassment from their own parents and families as a number of conservative orthodox families still oppose interfaith and intercaste marriages so it is on these grounds that the special marriage act has been controversial but despite this the supreme court has refused to look into the petition and has dismissed the petition so in this context the writer reminds us that the supreme court itself had recognized right to marry a person of one's choice as a fundamental right under article 21 but by refusing to evaluate the constitutional validity of these provisions the court is essentially allowing the family anti social outfits and even the state itself to interfere with marriages as several state governments have passed anti conversion laws targeted at interfaith marriages and this trend even empowers vigilante groups to harass couples even though these marriages are supposed to be between two consenting adults ideally with regard to marriage between two consenting adults neither the state nor the family nor the society has a right to interfere and while the supreme court has recognized this as a fundamental right it has refused to look into the shortcomings of the special marriage act which has been pointed out by the critics of the law now let's take up a column from page number 11 in which the writer makes a strong case for greater indian engagement in sri lanka to help out the country during its economic crisis and he identifies the specific sectors and measures that india can take in order to assist sri lanka during its time of crisis so in this context before we examine the column let's understand the background to sri lanka's economic crisis and what has india done until now to help its neighboring country see from the beginning of this year the sri lankan economy has descended into its gravest crisis as it witnessed a serious bop problem or a problem on its balance of payments as its foreign exchange reserves depleted to dangerous numbers making it all the more difficult for the country to continue its imports thus leading to shortage of even essential items and has made the country incapable of repaying its external loans a mix of factors have led sri lanka to this situation but what primarily contributed was the country's debt burden which had become unmanageable as it had borrowed excessively over the years from various donors including imf and the world bank and as well as from the international market through market borrowings and also from key powers like india japan and especially china the increasing debt burden was a direct result of economic mismanagement by successive sri lankan governments especially under the rajpaksa brothers as over the years the sri lankan government has borrowed irresponsibly while increasing its expenditure beyond sustainable levels thus placing the country under a severe debt burden to meet the mismatch sri lanka has borrowed heavily from the international market and also from global financial institutions including world bank imf and the asian development bank and parallelly the sri lankan economy was suffering due to the poor policies of the rajpaksa brothers who have been in power for almost 15 years earlier when mahinda rajpaksa was the president between 2005 and 2015 sri lanka borrowed heavily from china in particular to invest in key strategic projects such as the hambantota port project which considerably increased china's strategic influence but ended up weakening sri lanka's fiscal position but recently under the government of gotbhai rajpaksa sri lanka implemented several disastrous policies such as unsustainable tax cuts which were promised to win elections and a unscientific ban on import of fertilizers in order to force the country's agriculture 
to switch overnight to organic farming without any scientific basis. And all of this dealt a severe blow to Sri Lanka's domestic production and as well as to its key agricultural exports. Then upon this, the Sri Lankan economy was hit by several recent shocks, such as the Easter Sunday terror attacks and the COVID-19 pandemic, which affected the flow of tourists into the country, which has been a key source of foreign exchange for Sri Lanka. Recently, the Russia-Ukraine war disrupted global supply chains again, which had been earlier disrupted by the pandemic and led to a significant increase in commodity prices, thereby affecting Sri Lanka's forex reserves and its ability to continue its essential imports. So as Sri Lanka descended into this grave economic crisis, India, as its key neighbour, has stepped up and has already provided assistance in various forms worth close to $4 billion in order to rescue the neighbouring country and also to protect India's key interests in Sri Lanka. Amongst all the countries, India has been the most forthcoming and the largest assistance provided to Sri Lanka during this crisis. And you can clearly see that in the graph here as well. Even though Sri Lanka approached China for assistance, and even though China was committing to around $4 billion worth of assistance, this assistance has not really translated from China. Whereas India, on the other hand, has single-handedly uplifted the Sri Lankan economy through various forms of financial assistance. The Indian assistance you see in the graph here can be broadly divided into two categories, which includes assistance to meet the immediate requirements, such as basic essentials, including food items, fuel, etc., and assistance to Sri Lanka to revive its key sectors by providing new loans or by differing existing loan repayments in order to give the Sri Lankan economy the much-needed breathing space. Over the last few months, India has provided food, health and energy security package as well as to support the foreign exchange reserves of the country and the total amount of assistance stands between 3.5 to 4 billion dollars. This includes a concessional loan of around 1 billion dollars along with a line of credit of around 500 million for financing the purchase of petroleum products such as diesel and petrol from India which is essential to run its economy. Plus India also delivered a consignment of around 40,000 metric tons of fuel as an emergency aid to the country and this has led Sri Lanka to approach India again in order to protect its energy security and Sri Lanka has sought another 500 million dollars of line of credit which is currently being considered by India. Then to support its foreign exchange reserves, India has extended a currency swap facility through the RBI of around 400 million dollars under the SAR currency swap framework in order to help Sri Lanka manage its liquidity. India has also agreed to defer the repayment of loans worth around $1 billion which was due under the Asian Clearing Union and the RBI has agreed to provide an extension on the repayment of this loan. Apart from this, India has even dispatched a huge consignment of drugs and essential medical supplies to support Sri Lankan hospitals that were facing a critical shortage and has even delivered supplies of kerosene to support the Sri Lankan fishermen. Along with directly assisting the Sri Lankan government, India has even reached out to the Sri Lankan people directly through its High Commission and has delivered humanitarian assistance packages to the needy people, thereby generating a lot of goodwill among Sri Lankans, which has been backed up with a separate assistance from the state government of Tamil Nadu as well. So in this context, the writer argues that Apart from providing such immediate economic and financial assistance, India should help out Sri Lanka to revive its key revenue generating sectors and as well as sources of foreign exchange that includes agriculture, industries and especially tourism. To make this case stronger, the writer even provides examples of how Sri Lankans have been extremely appreciative of India's role in assisting the country and hence he argues that there exists a stronger case for greater Indian engagement because this would also serve Indian interests in the Indian Ocean. The writer says that, apart from providing loans and financial assistance, India should also be looking at sharing technical expertise and skills to revive the key sectors of the Sri Lankan economy. For example, Sri Lanka is still dependent on import of milk powder, which accounts for a significant part of its imports, so India can share its expertise in the dairy sector to make the country more self-sufficient. 
in the poultry sector as well, Sri Lanka has taken a big hit due to rising input costs such as medicines, bird feed, etc. So India can share expertise in cultivating the maize crop which can be a cheap source of bird feed along with providing the essential veterinary supplies to support the Sri Lankan poultry sector. The writer points out that India is already doing the right thing in the energy sector because India's Adani group has recently won a contract to develop renewable energy projects including wind power projects in the northern parts of Sri Lanka and India's NTPC or National Thermal Power Corporation has also won a contract to develop the Sampur Thermal Power Plant to meet Sri Lanka's energy needs. Other sectors where Sri Lanka could make use of India's expertise and help would be the MSME sector where India could share technology, skills and even help out in credit facilities as the MSME industry not only generates jobs but also provides a boost to exports. To support Sri Lanka's long-term recovery, Indian colleges and universities can also support Sri Lanka's education by setting up satellite centres and the writer also highlights the importance of cultural ties and cultural diplomacy where India could make it easier for Buddhist pilgrims to visit the pilgrimage sites in India. India already has the Buddhist Circuit Initiative through which it facilitates the pilgrimage of Buddhists from around the world to pilgrimage centres in India and under the initiative India has even been reviving tourist infrastructure. For example, recently India built and inaugurated the Kushinagar airport to facilitate Sri Lankan pilgrims to travel easily to these sacred pilgrimage sites. A few years back, the Indian High Commission in Colombo had even transported the sacred Kapilavastu relics, which is believed to contain the bone and hash fragments of Lord Buddha himself, so that Sri Lankans could pay homage to the sacred relics without having to travel to India. So such cultural initiatives could be taken forward, because this greater and deeper engagement of India in Sri Lanka's crisis would only fulfil Indian interests as it would further India's influence and it would help counter the Chinese presence. As we saw recently, a Chinese military spying ship recently docked at Sri Lankan ports, which was seen as a security threat by India. So to counter the Chinese presence and influence, such greater engagement by India would be essential as this would also nurture India's soft power and people-to-people -people relations between the two countries. These initiatives would also be in line with the objectives of India's Sagar doctrine through which India has committed to provide for security and growth for all in the Indian Ocean region. It will truly enable India to emerge as the net security provider of the Indian Ocean, thus helping India secure its key interests in the Indian Ocean. Now let's take up another column from page number 10, in which the writer examines the global legal framework against state surveillance. This topic comes up for discussion in the light of the Pegasus scandal, in which allegedly even the Indian government and its intelligence agencies had reportedly procured the spyware to snoop on its own citizens. While the government has denied all these allegations, an inquiry committee set up by the Supreme Court to look into these allegations has also failed to find anything substantial as it has blindly accepted the position taken by the government. So in this context, the writer points out that there is an urgent need for putting in place a system of checks and balances against unchecked state surveillance, which could lead to a gross violation of our fundamental rights. So here the writer argues that the Supreme Court has a role to play as it can nudge the government and the parliament to draw lessons from the global legal framework against state surveillance, as it is high time for India as well to have a law in place to check the powers of state surveillance and to hold the government and its agencies accountable for any misuse of these surveillance powers. See, while state surveillance is necessary on national security grounds, these surveillance powers of intelligence and security agencies cannot be unchecked and unaccountable. The writer points out, even in European countries and even in the US, where their security agencies do indulge in surveillance for security reasons, there are strong legal frameworks in place to ensure that there are checks and balances in order to prevent the abuse of these powers. For example, in the US, way back in 1986, the Wire Tap Act was introduced, which prohibits private agencies from engaging in surveillance. And when government seeks permission to carry out surveillance, 
it must apply to a federal court first for permission and the powers to carry out surveillance would be granted by the court only when there is no other option left to deal with the security threat. In 1997, in Ireland, the report on privacy was brought out which focuses on private parties which could potentially engage in surveillance on behalf of the state. This report recommended a law to fill the legal vacuum to ensure that new technology being deployed by the state and private agencies to carry out surveillance was kept under check. Then the Patriot Act of the US, which was specifically introduced after the 9-11 attacks to counter terrorism, mandates that court approval has to be obtained before any such surveillance. In the US, the FISA court has also been set up in 1978 or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, through which intelligence and security agencies must first obtain the FISA warrant before they carry out surveillance against targets. In fact, the legal framework in US against state surveillance has evolved to such an extent that in its Office of Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, which deals with highly classified intelligence, a civil liberties protection officer is appointed to keep a check on the abuse and misuse of surveillance powers. The officer even reports to the Congress on any violations and thus the Congress could hold the intelligence agencies accountable for any breach and violations. Then in Australia, in the state of New South Wales, a Law Reform Commission of 2005 established the Office of Privacy Commissioner with inspectors who were given the powers to investigate any complaints against state surveillance. The United Nations has also contributed to this legal framework, which mandates that there shall be no complete secrecy even for governments with regard to surveillance. Just stating that surveillance is in national interest and it's being done on security grounds is not good enough, according to the UN, as valid grounds for surveillance has to be established by the state. The European Court of Human Rights has also held that a secret surveillance system led by the state can undermine or even destroy democracy as it directly goes against basic fundamental rights. Across several democratic countries in Europe and also in Australia, court warrants are needed to obtain any such information through surveillance. And any such breach of privacy and intrusion has to be supervised by independent bodies. And all the surveillance records have to be maintained by the state and should be subjected to review if the need arises. Whereas no such provision exists in the case of India. So in most progressive democratic states, the principle with regard to surveillance is maximum disclosure and not secrecy. And the European legal framework in particular has recognized that journalists are the most vulnerable when it comes to being targets of state surveillance. Then if you look at the Venice Commission report of 2015, it states that right to privacy framework is not good enough to keep a check on the powers of the state to carry out surveillance and breach privacy. The Commission's report argued for a stronger legal framework where the state can be held accountable for any breach of privacy and it mandates independent control and oversight over surveillance operations of the executive by independent parliamentary bodies. It also calls for judicial review over state surveillance, including oversight by expert bodies, so that any abuse of powers by the executive can be held accountable. Then if you look at the UN good practices on oversight of institutions, Practice 6, Practice 7 and Practice 9, they respectively recommend the setting up of a civilian independent institution to check state surveillance powers and recommends that such an institution should be empowered to carry out an investigation against any alleged breach of privacy of citizens. It also recommends that individuals should be empowered to complain to courts against any state surveillance so that their fundamental rights can be guaranteed and any misuse of state powers can be subjected to judicial review. So as you can see, there has been a remarkable evolution in the global legal framework against state surveillance but unfortunately in India, no such law or no such checks and balances exist against the powers of state surveillance. Hence, the writer is arguing that it is high time for the Supreme Court and the Parliament to step up and contemplate a legal framework so that the state and its agencies can be held accountable for any surveillance that is deemed to be unnecessary and invasive of the citizens' fundamental rights. Next, we have an article on page number one 
that refers to alarming levels of retail inflation that is inflation at the consumer level as measured through the CPI index particularly at the state level because several states have been recording alarming levels of retail inflation which has even been going above the national average itself as you can see in the map over here several states are recording alarming levels of retail inflation and especially telangana tops the list with an average cpi inflation of 8.32% between january to july of this year if you observe the map many other states are experiencing high levels of inflation as well including andhra pradesh maharashtra madhya pradesh rajasthan gujarat uttar pradesh etc several states are consistently reporting an average inflation of over 7% which happens to be about the national average and also happens to be above the target range of 6% that has been prescribed for the financial stability and development council of the rbi responsible for containing inflation so in this context let's understand state level cpi in more detail see for measuring retail inflation or inflation at consumer level the consumption basket is critical as it determines what is being consumed by the households and helps in understanding expenditure at the household level for this purpose the cpi index measured at the state level relies upon a commodity basket and various essential goods and expenditures are identified across states which are all given a certain weightage in the basket based on which the data is accounted for through the national sample survey organization which conducts the consumer expenditure survey across states in both rural and urban areas this survey of the nsso is designed to collect expenditure and consumption level information which helps in identifying the spending patterns across states and then the data is computed through the cpi index in order to measure retail inflation in states both at the urban and rural level with 2011-12 as the base year for reference retail inflation levels are computed for both rural and urban regions of all the states which helps in determining the price levels based on consumption expenditure based on this assessment we saw that as of june 2022 several states were reporting high levels of cpi inflation as you can see in this map where states were reporting record levels of inflation with telangana reporting more than 10% with maharashtra and haryana reporting more than 8% inflation several other states reported a inflation of above 7% and studies have shown that the primary driving factors of inflation at the state level can be divided into three categories the first primary driver in most states especially in states like telangana haryana punjab and maharashtra has been expenditure on fuel and light which basically refers to energy related expenditure and includes components such as electricity lpg gas kerosene coal etc the secondary driver of retail inflation at state level has been food and beverages especially essential food items including fruits and vegetables and as well as primary sources of protein such as dairy products eggs meat etc in this category you can even see a significant contribution coming from edible oils as the price of edible oil has shot up due to disruption in global supply chains then comes the third category which is miscellaneous that includes essential expenditure on healthcare transportation communication personal care and other basic services so throughout the year these have been the primary factors which have been driving retail inflation at the state level now coming to the last article on page number 10 the editorial points out that india has a great opportunity to show a bigger heart in its hostile relationship with pakistan as the country faces a grave crisis as a result of the floods which have devastated the country unprecedented floods in the indus river basin has already killed hundreds of people in pakistan and has had a devastating impact on its economy and society so as pakistan appeals for aid and help from the global community the united nations and several other countries including us uk china and others have already announced economic assistance and relief packages to help pakistan india on its part has already sympathized with the situation 
after prime minister modi expressed condolences for the grief and losses that pakistan has suffered in the disaster in the past as well when pakistan was hit by disasters like earthquakes in the himalayan region india has set aside its hostility and tensions and has reached out to pakistan with all possible help and assistance so the editorial expects india to help out pakistan in line with india's established principles and policies because as you saw even during the covid-19 pandemic india took the leadership role in the region especially in south asia and in the indian ocean and reached out to all the countries with immediate assistance and india supplied essential medicines and drugs to several countries across indian ocean through mission sagar and later also engaged in a vaccine diplomacy by providing vaccines free of cost to several developing underdeveloped countries in the region and as well as around the world so this consistent humanitarian gesture from india establishes india as the primary responder during times of crisis and distress in the region and also cements india's position as a predominant regional power so in this context the editorial argues that india should continue with its tradition and practice of keeping away hostilities during such times of distress and this would be the right time for india to help out pakistan which could potentially provide an opportunity to repair the relationship as well upon this india should focus on working out a regional arrangement for south asia and indian ocean so that it can put in place a strong disaster management framework through which countries can help out each other during times of disasters now let's take a look at a couple of mains practice questions the first question why are section 6 to 10 of the special marriage act under scrutiny how are these provisions being misused the second question as sri lanka faces its gravest economic crisis examine the ways in which india can further help the country kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link has been given in the description box below so this concludes our discussion for today and if you like the initiative do let us know by sharing your comments don't forget to press the like button and do subscribe to our channel thanks for watching